So this is a class about becoming just like Jesus. The goal of this class is to become like him in the sense where we copy and paste. We look at Jesus, we see what he wants, what he does, and we implement in our life, right? We don't want it to be this type of discipleship where we're just like Jesus for moments or snapshots, but what do we want? What's the illustration? We want a movie. We want day to day to look just like Jesus. And so last class we talked about prayer. And what specifically about prayer? The quantity, right? We looked at the life of Jesus and we established, okay, we see Jesus over and over again praying. We see him praying at his baptism, the beginning of the day, the end of the day, multiple sections of scripture, him praying. We looked at Luke chapter 22, a verse I love where it talks about it was his custom to pray to go to the Mount of Olives. And so we looked at that and said, okay, if we're going to be like Jesus, we're going to pray like Jesus, we got to up the quantity. Because after looking at our own prayer lives, we realize something. What do we realize? We yeah, we fall short. We, we don't do very well. I, I imagine a lot of us rate ourselves a pretty low number because we look at our life and we say, okay, I need to improve. Because 
because there's things that come up. There's busyness, and there's just a lack of zeal and a lack of a relationship. We talked about that. And so we had to establish two things about Jesus. We had to talk about why Jesus prayed and how he prayed. What were the two things we said about why Jesus prayed? What, was the, what were the author's idea that I mentioned? Does anyone remember? He wanted to pray. First off, Jesus wanted to pray. He had this relationship with the Father. He has this fellowship. And we talked about how communication is just a byproduct of mutual love. If I love someone and they love me, conversation is going to stem from that. It's only natural, right? What else? We said uh, Jesus wanted to pray, but what else? He needed to pray. And, and we talked about that and how we're still wrestling with that. And I appreciate all of you who came up to me after class. And we're just sharing your thoughts on that point. So many of you came up to me and were talking about ways in which Jesus would have needed to pray. Some of you talked about temptation and how Jesus would have had a need to pray for strength and overcoming the temptations of the devil. Some of you talked about strength, like going in the wilderness and relying on God for sustenance. And so I appreciate those comments. And so Jesus needed to pray. We talked about Hebrews 5 and verse 7. But then we talked about how Jesus prayed. And we gave three R's and we talked about routine, resolve, and removal. The most important of those is routine, right? Uh, what does what's the H word that we're trying to make prayer? A habit. How long does it take to form a habit? So what does that say we need to be doing? Praying day in, day out, till eventually, what did that quote say? The habit will unfold automatically. It's going to be something that becomes easier in our life the more we do it. And so we we talked about quantity last class, but we need to talk about quality now. Right? Because we're going to look at Jesus, and Jesus is going to say, okay, even though you're praying, right, there can be some problems. Even if the quantity's there, you're praying every single day, there can be some things wrong. And so turn to Luke chapter 11, and, and throw your marker here. This is where we're going to be for the majority of the class. Um, I, I'll be honest with you guys, I made a grave mistake about three months ago. I started drinking coffee, and uh, I'm addicted now. I mean, it's bad. And I didn't drink any coffee today, and I've got a headache, and so I'm going to rely on you guys uh, to, to help lead this class. And so I, I expect many, many comments tonight as I suffer through this coffee migraine. Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse number 1. Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse number 1. I should say Luke 11. It says this. It happened that while Jesus was praying at a certain place, after he finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And when he said this to them, and then he said this to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, give us each our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not to temptation. What questions do the disciples ask Jesus? Yeah, they, they say, Jesus, okay, we look at you, and we look at your prayer, and as we'll talk about, we look at your teaching, and they say, okay, Lord, teach us to pray. What does that question imply? What are the implications of that question? They were doing it wrong, right? There's this wrong way to pray. Man, this came up in the wrong word. That's tough. <laughs> there's, a, there's a wrong way to pray, that they were doing it wrong, and that Jesus needed to teach them, right? That there's this aspect of prayer that is learning. And we alluded to this last class, but I think it's worth saying again, is that often prayer can feel like it should just be this automatic thing. And because of that, we become discouraged. We look at our prayer life, and, and we look at it, and we say, man, I'm just not a good Christian if I'm not praying like I should. Or I'm just not a good Christian if I'm not praying the way Jesus wants me to pray. But what this verse teaches us is that prayer is something we've got to learn and develop. And it's going to be something that takes time. It takes time for us to mature and grow in our faith to do it effectively. But if we can do prayer wrong, it really means we need to listen to the words of Jesus, right? Because that goes back to quantity. And no matter how much we pray, there's a wrong way we can do it. And I want to go to Matthew's Gospel now in Matthew chapter 6. Tonight's going to be more of a textual study. That's more me and JB's bread and butter. We like doing that. Matthew chapter 6. You, you see the context that that comes before this question from his disciples. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1, Jesus is, is giving this great sermon, and he begins to talk about prayer. And so in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1, it says, Beware of practicing.
practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. And so when you give to the poor, do not sound the trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the Jews, so they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward from the But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done will reward you. When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogue so that they may be seen by you. But when you pray, go and pray or in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words, so do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you even ask. And so we see the context that, that follows this question, or precedes this question by the disciples of, Lord, teach us to pray. Jesus is teaching, hey, these are things you shouldn't be doing in prayer. And so Jesus gives two things, two things we shouldn't do, and two groups of people we shouldn't pray like. Who's the first one in Matthew chapter 6? The hypocrites. The hypocrites. Jesus says, don't pray like the hypocrites. We see that in verse 5, don't we? When you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites. And what's wrong with the hypocrites' prayer? To be seen of men. They, they have a motive behind it, don't they? The reason they pray is they want to be seen by men. And so Jesus says, don't pray like that. And how does Jesus instruct his disciples to pray? Yeah, go into the inner room, go into that secret place and pray. Is that an absolute statement, meaning that we can't pray in public or we can't pray at mealtimes? No. no. Why? Because there are examples of Jesus doing this. There, there's examples of Jesus praying over meals, and there's examples of Jesus praying in, in the synagogues and in different places. And then they, when you get to the book of Acts, which we'll mention later, you have the, the group, the churches praying together over the Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 12. And so automatically we, we can't assume that it's this agenda or this absolute statement. But what Jesus is trying to say is we need to have correct motive when we lift our prayers and petitions before the Father. A mindset of humility. Acknowledging who we pray to. Acknowledging that we come before the Father, not that we come before men. I read this quote in the book I was reading. Such prayers are an insult to God when we mouth words towards God while we really are trying to impress men. And others, when we use God merely as a tool to impress others. What the author was writing about was how prayer and pride do not mix, or, or I should say true prayer and pride do not mix. And then he talked about the posture of prayer itself. The posture of prayer itself uh, denies pride, doesn't it? Because we are bowing before the God Almighty. And so it's really ironic what the hypocrite is doing here. Even though he's bowing before God, pretending to pray and bow to the God on his throne, who has he placed on the throne in his life? Himself. He's praying in a way that others can look at him and praise him. They sit below the throne that he has made in his mental mind, and they, they praise him, and they come to him with their spiritual questions. He exalts himself to the place of God in his prayer. It's really ironic what he's doing. So Jesus says, hey, don't pray like the hypocrites. And I think we can struggle with that, praying for, for uh, selfish reasons and praying out of pride. But I don't think that's where exactly we struggle today, uh, maybe in congregational settings. But I think the second one is where we struggle more. Who does, who's the second group of people Jesus says not to pray like? The Gentiles. The Gentiles. We're going to put pagans. I believe that's more specific wording. Just speaking of religious people. Jesus says, don't pray like the Gentiles or the pagans. Verse 7, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. What's so bad about their prayers? Repetition. Repetition. Oh, don't have a verse up there. It's repetition. It is them just saying words over and over again in this desperate attempt for God to hear them. They, they formulate these prayers. They say these things over and over again because... This is what they've been taught God wants to hear. And if I say this, God is going to hear me. One commentator writing about this said the NIV translates the phrase vain repetition here in Matthew chapter 6 as keep on babbling. And this is an accurate sense of the ancient Greek word babbling, and I know I butchered that just a little bit, 
which is a word that sounds like babbling and has the sense of blah, blah, blah. That's kind of funny, isn't it, what Jesus is saying here? And their attempt to sound beautiful before God and their attempt to sound uh, put together and these creeds and these, uh, these sayings that they've heard for years, what God is hearing is blah, blah, blah. It's this silliness that is coming before him. Isn't that interesting what Jesus is doing here in this text? I think we might struggle with this idea as well. I don't know about you guys, but I know for me personally that I've struggled with this sense of trying to formulate these beautiful prayers to God. Especially in a, in a congregational setting. Especially when I'm, you know, praying over the meal when people are looking and watching. I, I want to say all the right words. I want to say it in a way that is beautiful. A way they've never heard it before, right? And I think when we start to think like that, we look a lot like the pagan, don't we? And maybe our prayers can become less effective. But, but how else might we struggle with this? Uh, sure, we want our prayers to sound beautiful and grammatically correct and all that stuff. But, but what's our other struggle? with what the pagans do. This is a really bad way of asking this question. So if you don't get it, they're saying the same thing over and over. Yes, there we go. I love it. <laughs> it's saying words that over time eventually lose their meaning. And they become meaningless to us, even though we're saying them, right? Uh, on your handout, and, and by the way, I don't know if Lauren told you or not, the handout's kind of reversed, so just play around with it. Uh, there should be some black lines. And on the black lines, I want you to write down and it can be in your life, it can, or, or it can just be something in general that you feel like has gotten watered down, that has become meaningless over time to you, or to just in general, to the Lord's people. What has become meaningless repetition for us, or for you personally, over time? What phrases, what words have become meaningless repetition in your prayer life? writing one down, I'll share one of mine that I was reflecting on and thinking about this week while I was preparing. I realized forgive me of my sins had become something in my life in, in, in times past where it's become meaningless repetition. <clears throat> you know, I've been taught ever since I'm a little kid to, to end my prayers, Father, forgive me of my sins when I'm praying. And, and over time, that, that's become meaningless to me. Why? Because I don't, there's no emotional involvement with that phrase. There's no connection to sense. It's kind of just a blanket statement. God, I know I did things wrong this week. Yeah, just cover them up. You know, just get rid of them. And I don't, it doesn't hit me how broken I am, how in need of him I am, and how God, I desperately want you to, to forgive me of those sins. Over time, hey, forgive me of my sins is just in some words. Words that I say to God that have no meaning in my heart. What about you all? What words have become meaningless repetition? Not necessarily for your life, just in general. Right. You brought up restaurants. Sometimes uh, you'll hear somebody say at a restaurant, uh, "Bless the hands that prepare." Uh -huh. I'm not sure that the guy back in McDonald's flapping burgers is, is the one that we're praying for. But mm -hmm. I mean, it's just so repetitious that we we don't even realize what we're praying for. We we should do that, you know. Bless. Mm -hmm. uh, we're asking God to bless the hands that prepared our food, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it's just it's meaningless. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, there's these phrases that we can say over and over again. Oh, I had, uh, thank you for this food on my list. And, and, I, and I forgot to add this section that Don told me to add, so we're going to say it. it is, let me say this. I'm not going to talk about congregational prayers in this class. Um, it is impossible, and, and I just as a preacher, you know, this is me speaking to you all, and, and, and I definitely have to caution myself and, and check my heart sometimes. It is impossible for me to tell something they say is vain repetition on the stage. You know, if they say, guide, guard, direct us, then I may look at that and say, I don't really know what that means. I feel like we said that for years. But to them, that may have really significance in their life. Maybe they've gone through a section or a season in their life where they've prayed daily, God, guide, guard, and direct me. And God has answered that prayer. And he's led them through a valley in life. And so, and just with anything, it's impossible for us to look at a man in the pulpit or, 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 or a man praying, praying over the food with a large group of people and say, yeah, I don't know about that. I think that's vain repetition. So I want to keep it pretty low, centralized to us tonight. And centralized to just some things in general that may become. So I'm not trying to accuse anyone of anything, all right, whatever happens in this class tonight. There's my section. 
It's out there. <laughs> what else could become vain repetition? What have you found in your life? Uh, a lot of times it's kind of attached onto the brain for food thing. I say something like, and bless my body to your service. Yeah. And I don't exactly realize what I'm asking when I say that. Like, <laughs> oh wait, God's giving me an opportunity to serve. Why is he doing that? Oh, maybe because I pray that mm -hmm. every single day. I think that's a great one. I uh, I definitely think that's a great one. Sometimes we, we have these prayers where we where we say, God, use me. Open the door for evangelism. And they're just empty words. We don't really have any desire to, to back it up and to use what God has given us for his glory. I like that a lot. What else? It's okay. You have nothing. <laughs> Sometimes we play just like for sick, be with the sick, just kind uh -huh. of in the generic. And I mean, obviously in such a large congregation where there's so many people, it can be. But an in individual thing, I think it means a lot more. We have a list in what they're struggling mm -hmm. with and specifically pray for Yeah, that's one of those phrases, just kind of like, forgive me of my sins, where we're taught from a you know a little age where, where we're supposed to say, oh, help the sick people, right? And as time goes on, we just say that and we really don't think about who, who needs prayers. You know, who are those people that really need God's hand right now? Because God wants me to pray for them. Because when we pray for a mint, prayer is something we need to do because Jesus showed us it's powerful and it does stuff. Right? I love that. What else? I think that's a great one too. Uh, when we pray for things, and again, it just doesn't seep into our heart what we're praying for. There, there's no, there's, they're just words. They have become meaningless repetition to us. Things that do you have something, Mr. Carey? Well, just to yeah, go ahead. Uh, if it's a, if it's a true blessing to you, and you're praying for that Well, and, and just as we'll talk about it, as any child would do with their father, I mean, they're, they're going to be excited about what they've been given, and they're going to talk about it, and, and there's going to be this exchange of mutual love between them. I think those are great answers. And so my caution would be to you all, as we're just trying to pray like Jesus, we need to think about what we're saying. Uh, I think it can be easy uh, to pray these prayers and be just like the pagans, and in some cases just be like the hypocrites, where we just pray and we don't think about our hearts, and we don't think about the words we're saying. And what Jesus is showing us in Matthew chapter 6, both are really important. If we're going to pray the way he prayed, and pray in a way that is pleasing before him. And so, Jesus says, I don't want you to pray like them. I don't want you to pray like the hypocrite or the pagan. And then the, 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 or the disciples ask, okay Lord, how should we pray then? And Jesus is going to tell them how they should pray. Look at Luke chapter 11 with me again. Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. It says, It happened while Jesus was praying in a certain place. After he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each our daily bread and forgive us our sins for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. What is this prayer commonly referred to as? The Lord's Prayer. And so I feel like if we're trying to become like Jesus, if we're trying to look at his life and do things that he'd want us to do, I feel like this would be a pretty good place to go to look at the Lord's Prayer. And so we need to understand a few things about it. Just like Jesus saying that we should go into a secret or, or a, a room alone, this isn't an absolute statement. This isn't a script for us, but it's a pattern for us to follow. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus would say, pray like this. And so we need to keep that in mind as we go throughout this prayer tonight. We can be confident that this is not the only prayer Jesus wants us to pray, because we've, as we've already talked about, that we have examples of other prayers in the Bible. We have examples of, of Jesus blessing the bread, and we have examples of the disciples in Acts chapter 12 as they prayed for Peter. I can't imagine their prayers went, okay, Lord, give us each our daily bread. 
as Peter's in prison. But no, they were, they were making a petition for him, weren't they? They were saying, hey, help our friend out. Bring him back to us. Keep him safe while he's there. Help his faith. I, I feel like, or I, I know for a fact that we can, we can look at all of the New Testament examples, and, and they don't really fit word for word with Jesus' prayer here in Luke chapter 11. Um, it kind of cancels out the whole cast all your anxieties on him when we're limited to daily bread and uh, hallowed be your name, right? We can't, we can't say, well, help me out with the insurance company. No, God doesn't want to hear that one because Luke chapter 11, this is the script for us. Y'all, i got to tell you a story. Today, it was the end of the work day. And, you know, end of the work day, 5 o'clock, we are ready to go, right? You know, this is the adult life. Woo! And uh, I got a call at 4.40 from the insurance company, and they said, Carson Crowe? I said, yes. They said, do you have 20 minutes to discuss something? And they talked to me for 25 minutes on the phone about insurance. It was awful. I had a pain. It was terrible. I needed, I needed for those moments. Um, I don't know how I got on that. Um, so you had to put 505? Is that what you said? <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. Um, just getting that over time. Working hard for the others. <laughs> So Jesus wants us to pray in a variety of ways. This isn't a script for us to follow. It's an outline. It's a pattern that teaches us some things. I love this quote. It's not on the screen, so listen hard. This prayer is notable for its simplicity and brevity. It is a marvel of powerful prayer, but in the simplest terms. It is teaching us how to pray these powerful, these bold, these effective prayers in the simplest form Jesus gives us. Man, it's like the cheat sheet. I love it. And so Jesus is going to give us this prayer, and it's a pretty simple structure. It, it starts with spiritual needs, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, in Matthew's account. And then it talks about physical needs, give us each our daily bread, and the last two deal with spiritual again, forgive us and lead us not into temptation. Others give it a structure of praise and submission, request and forgiveness. Praise, hallowed be your name, submission, your kingdom come, your will be done. Or request your kingdom come, and, or excuse me, request, give us each our daily bread, forgive us, and then lead us on to temptation would be protection. And so we're not going to walk through this entire prayer tonight, but I want to point out two very important things, and, I, and I'd love for your, your comments and your thoughts, because last class was great. I loved it, and you all just sharing what you thought of prayer and your answers and, and your support when I was asked tough questions. I love that. I'm all about that. And so if you have anything you want to say during these points, just shout it out. Again, no hand raising, all that stuff. All right. When we see, we, what we see first in the prayer that I want to point out is God wants us to pray for physical things. God wants us to pray for physical things. We talked a lot about this last class, and so this is going to be rehashing some familiar ground. But in 1 Peter 5, verse 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Philippians 4, verse 6, don't be anxious about anything but in everything in prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to God. Paul's saying, pray about everything, all right? Pray about everything in your life, situational, uh, financial. It could be a situation at work, whatever it might be. Uh, but what I want to mention about this point that maybe pushes the envelope, maybe it helps you see this prayer in a different light, is where do we typically get God wants us to pray for our physical needs from? In this prayer. Give us our daily bread, right in the middle, physical needs, right? We, we look at that and we say, okay, God wants us to pray for our physical needs. Can I push the envelope a little bit on that? Where you can get, why you can get that point from there? I really think this point comes from the first word of the prayer, doesn't it? Father. Father, hallowed be your name. We don't think about that very much, do we? And we talked about this last class again. But that one description teaches us a lot about prayer and what we should be praying for, doesn't it? Jesus could have started this prayer any way he wanted to. I mean, he's giving us a model to follow that is going to shape how we pray for centuries. He could have started with Yahweh, right? That would have been familiar. He could have started with, pray, I am, how would be your name? He could have given no name for us to pray to. We could just say, hallowed be your name. But he starts the prayer, Father. And again, this isn't Jesus' prayer. This is Jesus giving us a prayer to pray. And he says, Father, hallowed be your name. Because Jesus does not want us to view God as this it in the sky. 
He doesn't want us to view God as this vending machine with no emotion or no love, but he wants us to see him as this personal, protecting, and giving father who wants to bless his children. And I can say that confidently because that's what Jesus is going to emphasize right after this prayer. Look at Luke chapter 11, verse 11 with me. Luke chapter 11. This is a well-known passage. Luke 11 and verse 11. Now suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. Will he not give him a snake instead of a fish? Will he? Or if he is asked for an egg, will he not give him a scorpion? Will he? If then being evil, how... If then being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who have asked Him? What is Jesus trying to say in that section of Scripture? What's your, what's your commentary? What's your hot take on it? We have a loving Father who is uh, bent on providing for our needs. Yeah, we have we have this loving Father who wants to give to His children when they ask. What else? He already knows what we need. He already knows what we need, um, and and maybe that could be in a whole class of itself why He wants us to pray. I, I definitely refer um, uh, walking through the sea by uh, Roger Polanco during the FC lectures. If you haven't listened to that, go go find that on their website. He talks about how Moses raised his uh, hand and God raises his, and they work in, uh, they work together, and that has a lot to do with prayer. Uh, really good topic. But uh, he already knows our needs. He's this father who loves, and, 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 and as any father notices, he notices what his children need, and he wants to give it to them, right? And so then he's going to talk about how we should pray persistently, and when we pray persistently, God wants to help us. What else do we see from Luke chapter 11, verses 11 through 13? He's better at it than we are. He's better at it than we are. Jesus is saying, okay, if your earthly fathers can do this, how much more can your heavenly father give to you and give abundantly to you? And because he knows your needs, right? More than anyone else ever could, right? And that's something we need to think about uh, as we talked about in the last class. If we want to pray like Jesus, if we need to, to view, have a correct view of God. And he's this God, he's our father who loves us. And we see that through Jesus, don't we? And how he gave Jesus. And you know, while an earthly father... Maybe able to give his, give his kid a good gift, maybe an Xbox or whatever for Christmas. God said, "Hey, here's my son, and he's going to die for you." And as we talked about in that communion meditation, he canceled out all that debt that you've accumulated because he loves you, because he's compassionate and merciful. And so, do, uh, yeah, uh, yes. Let me give an example. When I was 14 years old, I had wonderful parents, but they were going through a rough time, uh -huh. and I prayed for a good wife. Yeah. Wow, that's really cool. I love to see that. I love hearing about prayers that, that you, you can see God answer. Uh, like we talked about last class, sometimes it's hard to know. Did God really answer my prayer? Is God working on this? But it's amazing when we can see God answer my prayers and he heard me because he's that loving Father. I love that. Anything else? Um, so, we need to pray about everything. We need to have this view of God that He's our Father. Because He's our Father, He wants us to cast our worries, our anxieties on Him. But I need to, to caution us. And if I don't say this, you all will. Because I know how, how good Bible is you are. Jesus is not asking for us to pray for a storehouse of bread. Jesus isn't asking us to pray for a storehouse of bread. This is not a prayer of our, our this is a prayer of our needs, not our greed. And so we need to ask ourselves, even though God wants us to lay these things out before Him and pray to Him with these physical needs in our life, we really need to ask ourselves, is this a need? Is this something that I need in my life? Or is this something that had, the devil was working inside of me through greed and through want? Turn to Proverbs chapter 3. Uh, I love this passage. This is one of my favorite Proverbs in Proverbs chapter 30. If... Uh, if you're one of those people like me who just love to mark up your Bible and to uh, underline, uh, look at Proverbs 30 with me. And this is definitely one to underline, maybe put on the bridge. And something as I was just reading it this week, I really noticed how it, it fit into the formula that Jesus gave his disciples on how to pray. If you notice it, you kind of look around and you rearrange it. It's the exact same prayer structure as this one. Proverbs chapter 30, beginning in verse 7. Proverbs 30, verse 7. Two things I ask of you. Now refuse me before I die. 
keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion, that I will be full and deny that I will not be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or that I shall not be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. He's saying, Give me my daily bread, because hallowed be your name, and your will be done in my life. I love that prayer. And so we need to remember as we pray for our physical needs that we don't need to be praying in greed, but we need to be praying in need. And so we need to keep that in mind. But also, we need to look at where this is this is located in the prayer. And that's the reason I have the structures up there tonight. Where is physical need? Where is this daily bread, this asking of things located in the prayer? What is it sandwiched in between? Yes, or, yeah, that's what we're going. Where is it sandwiched in here? In between what? Spiritual. Spiritual, all right? So automatically, we need to look at that and realize out of the three things, two are spiritual, one is physical, right? And so we're going to talk about that in a, in a minute where there needs to be a focus. But I think Jesus is trying to tell us, okay, we need to have a lens about what we ask for uh, physically. That there has to be a spiritual lens when we ask for physical things. Where we need to realize, is what I'm asking for, does it, does it truly submit to the will of God? Is it truly about, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come? Or am I asking things because, hallowed be my name? Because I want this, because I want this life. Not because, this, not because God has put me in this position, not because um, I'm in need, but I want this. And so we need to think about that. But also we need to think about what, what it follows, and that's submission. Submission to your will be done. And we talked about this a lot last class. Uh, what do we need to be okay with when we pray? The answer. We need to be content. We need to submit to the answer. Why? Because your will be done. Uh, this prayer teaches us a lot. It teaches us a lot about prayer because it teaches us that even though God may not act the way I want him to, even though he may not answer that prayer about my job or what's going on or my family, above all, I want his will to be done in my life. And there's some trust that needs to be developed. There's some love that we need to see. But when we pray, we need to have an attitude of, God, even if you don't, you don't give me this daily bread. Hey, your will be done because of who you are, because of what you've done for me in the past. Um, it teaches us to pray like Jesus prayed. And I know I've gone this long without reading Jesus' prayer in the garden, and I think that's pretty cool in this class. So let's read it now, because this is one of the greatest prayers we will ever find. I didn't put the text. So I'm going to pick a random gospel and we're going to go there. <laughs> I hear y'all turn in your Bibles, so I'll turn in mine. Turn with me to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. And we'll read verse 39 because it's a good text. Verse 39 and 46. Here's what Jesus teaches us about prayer. Luke 22, verse 39. And he came out and proceeded as was his custom to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples also followed him. When he arrived at that place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. How often are we praying that prayer in our life? Just a side note. When he withdrew from them, he knelt down about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Jesus prayed, God, I want you to do this some other way. I do not want to go through this, even though as we talked about, Jesus is willing. He was willing to do it because he loves us and he's compassionate us and he sees us and he sees our need and he is the God who will save us. But he's saying, if you can do this any other way, do it. But then what does he follow that with? Not my will, but yours be done. And so when we pray for physical things, we may have a prayer similar to Jesus where we're saying, okay, I don't like where I'm at in this situation. I don't like what's coming up. I don't like where I, the trajectory of my life is taking me. 
But what needs to be the follow-up to that prayer? Your will be done. Whether we say that or whether we think that, it has to be in our heart. Right? That's what Jesus wants when we pray. And so when we pray for physical things, we need to have the attitude of Jesus. But I want to talk about the second thing in this prayer. And you probably already know if I'm going to pray for physical things, you probably can guess what's going in the second box. But I think this is where we maybe struggle. And, and, and of course we struggle with your will be done. Uh, that's something that, that has to be developed over time. It's not something that's automatic, but something that we learn to do as we learn who God is and we come to know him. But I think this is something we struggle with. Because when we think about prayer, I didn't ask this question, but if we were going to talk about what prayer is, I'm sure the, the, the common answer would be it's where we ask for things. It's where we, we bring our supplications, our petitions before God, and we ask for things in our life, things that are going on. And that's absolutely right. But I think that fails to miss the second part of prayer that Jesus wants us to see. And that's, that's prayer is about spiritual things. Praying is about spiritual things, and if we're going to pray like Jesus, and we're going to pray in a way Jesus wants us to pray, there has to be a spiritual element to our prayers that we bring before Him. Turn to John chapter 17. John chapter 17 is that, that text I mentioned in the last class that is just this long prayer by Jesus, a place where we can learn a lot about prayer. But in John chapter 17, I want us to notice the prayer of Jesus. The example he gives us in scripture of prayer. John chapter 17. And we're going to jump around a little bit. So verse 1 says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you. Verse 9. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those who have, you have given me. For they are yours all are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, as you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Verse 15. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. That you are not of this world, just as I am out of this world. Sanctify them in truth. Your, tr your word is as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. Let's stop there for just a second. What do you notice about Jesus' prayer? Where is the focus? There's a couple possible answers. No one right answer. The Father. The Father. The Father. What else? Others. Others. Unity. Unity? Unity? I like that. What else? In John chapter 17. He wants them to be sanctified. He He's wants them to be for their sanctification. Yeah, he wants them to be sanctified. I like that. All these answers are right, by the way. I'm not just moving on past people. <laughs> what else? The truth. Truth. Yeah, I like that. What I've seen in all your answers is there's, there's a spiritual dynamic to it. When he's praying for others, he's specifically praying for others so that they will be sanctified, that they will remain in truth, that, that God's not just going to leave them all by themselves when Jesus goes away. He's praying for others in that sense. What, the unity is purposed in God being glorified here on earth and his will being accomplished. Jesus at the very beginning of the prayer is saying, Father, glorify me. Why? So he can you know, be exalted by men and be king of the world? No, so God can be seen in him that his will can be accomplished. And he prays about truth. I just pray about truth, but he, he's talking about the word of God. God's word, our truth. There is this spiritual element to Jesus' prayer. Now, I'm not saying we can't pray prayers that, that are just, you know, us, a quick prayer that we're saying, okay, God, this is going on in my life. I need help. Here it is. And we send that prayer. And it's wrong because, oh, we didn't add, hallowed be your name. Or we didn't add what Jesus said, you know, glorify me or help me. To, to accomplish your world. I'm not, I'm not saying those prayers are wrong and we have those quick prayers that we just need, we need help with. But I'm saying if our prayer life is absent of spiritual things, maybe it doesn't look like Jesus is at all. If we're going to pray like Jesus, we need to pray for spiritual things. And so we have about five minutes left in class. And so I just want to want to hear from you. What are some spiritual things that you feel like we need to be praying more? 
What are some things that we need to be adding into our daily prayer life that are of spiritual nature that we should be? I, man, I was getting crazy up there. What are some spiritual things we should be praying for? Salvation of the lost. Salvation of the lost. Paul, Paul's going to tell us, hey, we need to be praying for doors to open, but, but also we need to pray that these people are moved. That, that God works. He either works in us or He works through them and then He helps them see that they're desperate. They're in desperate need of salvation. Right? I love that. We need to be praying for lost people. We need to be praying about those family members that we have that are, are lost. We don't need just to write them off or not think about them, right? But when we have those lost people in our lives, we need to be desperately coming before the Father and saying, I need your help with this. And they need your help. Please, Father, open their eyes that they may see. I like that. I like that a lot. What other spiritual things should we be praying for? Discernment. Discernment. I love that. Um, as a 20-year-old who's, who's still trying to figure it out and comes to a lot of these tough passages, I think that's a great prayer for us to be praying. Father, your word is truth. Help me, help me see it for what it is. Help me remove all these distractions. Help me remove my preconceived notions of what I think it is. And Father, show me what you want me to see. I love that. Discernment. And even discernment in life, just wisdom. I got a lot of decisions, you know. Lord, help me make the right ones. I love that. What else? I know the recent panel discussion made me want to pray for preachers who are in those situations more like Johnny and Roger and Ben and guys like that. And just yeah. global kingdom efforts. Yeah, I, I love that. We need to be praying for the workers out there. I, and I'm sure they would say, we need, we need the prayers. I love that. What else? We need to pray for knowledge so we, we can understand the word. Knowledge. We need to be praying for knowledge. We need to be praying that one, we uh, you know, we hear good Bible teaching, right? And we have we come to church and we 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 pray for the success and the seed to be planted in us. But we also need to be praying. Okay, give me an open heart and give me access. Give me time to access your word and read it. I love that. Uh, there's a hand back here. Uh, uh, we need to glorify God more in our prayers. I was thinking about that as I read Jesus' prayer. I I was thinking. Or Jesus, God, how many times have I asked you that, that I could glorify you in my life, right? How many times have I asked for a position where, regardless of what I'm going through, I want you to be seen in this? How often have I said, hey, even though I'm in the valley of life, I'm going to shine you today, right? Man, am I praying that prayer? I love that. What else? Just a couple more. I'd like to encourage people to pray for preachers to move to look in foreign lands. Yeah, that's a great work going on. Pray that preachers have courage to do that. I love that. What else? Boldness. Boldness. Uh, I think that's a great prayer. We live in an intimidating world, whether we want to admit that or not. It, it's hard to, to talk about Jesus in a culture that, that hates him, that hates what he has to say. And so our prayers need to be about boldness. I love that. Some other things I had were pray about our shepherds, our elders, pray about political leaders, the way Paul instructs us to pray that we can live in peace and tranquil lives, right? We need to be praying about spiritual things. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. I appreciate it.